Okay, so brilliant. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Hope you're all safe and well wherever you are in the world. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to you today. Um, I'd like to tell you all about OCO technology and, and our process for valorization of fly ash as a construction material. The just so you know, the, the name OCO, um, very simply, it is a representation of, of a carbon dioxide molecule. The core to our process is the exhilaration carbonation technique that you just heard all about in the, in the NOAA presentation. Uh, just a quick history. Um, we were founded in, in 2010, so we've been operational for, for nearly 10 years now. We built our first facility in, in 2012. Our history goes back a long way. The, the technology is based upon 20 years of university-based research and development. And the, the process, as I mentioned, we, we, we built our first facility in 2012, and that was following achieving end of waste in the UK. So we have uh, official endorsement from the UK Environment Agency for our process and our product. And more recently, we have been listed on the European Commission Sustainability Programme Good Practice Database as a, as a, as a secondary endorsement. We recycle a, a whole range of different thermal residues. Um, the main one is fly ash and air pollution control residues from municipal in, uh, energy recovery. But we also take in residues from, from other industries as well. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on. And the key output from our process is a lightweight carbon negative aggregate. So just a few key statistics on, on OCO. We currently have three sites operational in the UK and we have a, an annual turnover of around 15 million. We're currently the market leader in the UK for the recycling or the handling of um, fly ash and APCR around 27% and to date we have recycled around 1 million tonnes of fly ash and APCR. Our typical annual output across our three sites is in excess of 300,000 tonnes of aggregate. More recently we've started to look um, internationally to expand and we currently have five international projects in various stages of development but we've also had engagements with a total of 15 countries around the world. The, the core of the process, the accelerated carbonation, is a very, very, very simple in principle. We're taking a, a reactive waste um, that contains free lime, we add water and CO2, and we form calcium carbonate. The actual manufacturing process to take a, a fly ash or a, another thermal residue and convert it into an aggregate is a bit more complicated than that and involves multiple steps. We take in materials from a number of different facilities into each of our sites. Um, they are stored in a series of silos and they are blended together. And the, the blending step is really key for achieving consistency and the chemical and physical performance required in the finished aggregate product. That blended material is delivered to a, a mixing vessel where we add water and liquid CO2. And it's during this step that the the carbon is, is converted into calcium carbonate and we achieve chemical stabilization of heavy metal species which are converted to uh, less soluble carbonates and also you, as you heard in the previous presentation uh, the pH moderation also is very effective at stabilizing heavy metals. The product from this stage basically a calcium effectively a calcium carbonate powder then goes into a second stage where we add some additional reagents to achieve additional stabilization and solidification and that mixture is then pelletized in order to form a rounded pelleted aggregate product that pelleted product is then delivered to storage bays where it's allowed to cure and then the finished aggregate, which we call MLS or manufactured limestone, is then tested and then delivered to our customers. The potential for accelerated carbonation extends to a, a wide variety of different residues. As I mentioned, our focus in the UK is upon fly ash from energy from waste. 
but the technology can be applied to residues arising from the cement industry, the steel industry, biomass and paper as well. And if we look at the global arisings of those materials and then the potential carbon capture within those materials, which can be anything up to 25% by weight, if you could, if you could, it, it would be nice to, to achieve it. Um, if you were to convert all of that into a construction product, there's a potential to capture up to 240 million tonnes of carbon dioxide. I've just included some, so some photographs so you can see one of our sites. This is our, this is our newest site in the UK. So this is the, the silo bank that I mentioned that uh, we use for storage of the incoming residues. And one of our, one of our tanker trucks This shows the, the first stage of the process. So we have the, the blue mixing vessels, which are used for the uh, carbonation step, the stabilization step. You can see in this picture that there are actually there are two vessels. This each of our sites is, is modular and they typically consist of two parallel lines. Each one is capable of processing five tons of waste per hour. Um, we are due to be building new, new sites in the UK and those will be larger. They will have three parallel lines running. And here's a view, this is actually still un under construction. This site has, has been operational now for about two years, but it's still just, just in the final stages of construction in this picture. But this shows on, on the left-hand side, you can just see the, the blue mixing vessels. That, that is the, the, stage, the second stage of our process where we add the additional stabilization reagents. And then to, on the, towards the right-hand side, you can see the horizontal pelletizing drums, which are used to, to form the pelleted aggregate. The products we produce, as I mentioned, manufactured limestone, which we've achieved end of waste, and it's a carbon negative product according to PASS 2050. We, we certify the product to uh, the British standard for lightweight aggregates. And because of its credentials, it's extremely good for our customers in terms of achieving BES 6001, which relates to sustainable sourcing of raw materials. Equally, we, we are competitive, um, but we have the added advantage that we are a consistent material. We're a manufacturing material. We can adjust our process to ensure that the aggregate is the same every day. But it also means that we can be adjustable and it is possible to us, for us to produce different types of aggregates and changing parameters such as density, size and strength. And there are multiple applications the material can be used in. Predominantly, it, it goes into masonry blocks, but we have also looked at other opportunities in terms of screeds and going into asphalt. So looking at some of the, the technical challenges that uh, we've had to uh, uh, overcome, Clearly, there's always that, and I'm sure everyone uh, here is, is aware of the challenges of taking something from uh, a, a laboratory to a full commercial operation. And certainly our experience has been no different. And there's been a, a lot of work that has gone into the, uh, the, the improvement of the, the sites and, and getting them running efficiently. One of the, probably one of the key challenges that we have on a day-to-day -day basis is that waste streams are highly variable. And as such, we've had to develop our process and our procedures so that we can adjust the process in real time to ensure that there's always consistency in the end product. We hold a lot of know-how relating to the blending and the process formulations to achieve this. And the additional challenges that we've had to embrace a wide range of technical skills from right through from ash chemistry right through to recycled aggregate applications and understanding the linking of technical work to produce a marketable recycled aggregate product. We've had to uh, spend a lot of time developing very robust factory production control and quality management systems. Um, both from the front end in terms of the management of the waste material and also on the quality management of the aggregate product because we have our end of waste obligations, we have a specification that was agreed with the environment agency that we have to meet and we also have the technical performance that we have to adhere to in order to certify to the aggregate standards.
So there's a lot of testing that goes on on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure that. Some of the barriers that we've, we've encountered, um, legislative policies, end of waste um, is, is interpreted differently in every country. And, and we know from experience that certain countries don't yet even have an end of waste framework. End of waste may be, is also known by other, other terms such as beneficial use as well as another one that we've encountered. So when we've looked at international opportunities, we've had to look at that end of waste framework again and again. Market acceptance has also been uh, a, a, ch a challenge, particularly from the industries that we work in, so the sort of concrete construction industry, as Noah highlighted, uh, quite conservative. There's this, there has been certainly historically this perception that materials that are valorized from waste are somehow substandard, which clearly is not the case. Um, pleased to see that attitudes are now changing and that people are more and more embracing these new technologies and seeing waste more as a resource rather than a, rather than a problem. There's a lot of uh, complication in the regulations and I, I think there's the, the, you have to jump through many hoops so to speak in order to get your process uh, approved and get your your products approved and I think there is a, a need for some kind of um, simplification with that of course comes the danger that uh, materials can be put back into the supply chain that are not fit for purpose but I think the, the framework that we currently have has grown somewhat organically and that does place quite a number of barriers particularly for fledgling companies that don't have a huge amount of financial resource or backing. One of the other areas that is, is challenging for us is the fact that there is still a zero, certainly in the UK, there's a zero price point for green products. People love the idea of sustainable materials or carbon friendly materials, but very few people are prepared to pay any extra for that. And as such, we find ourselves having to compete with uh, regular primary materials and depending upon the market conditions that, that those prices can be very low. Equally, we're still seeing competitive behavior from less technical solutions for the disposal of ashes, particularly, particularly landfill, which is still relatively cheap in, in a number of territories. So the possibilities then, um, one of the benefits we've, we have of being commercially uh, in commercial operation for eight years is that we've amassed a large amount of technical data to support our technology and also through supply in some very big multinational companies in the UK, we've got endorsements for our, our product, which means that um, our engagements overseas have been um, supported by that. There's also a, a greater corporate responsibility towards sustainability. So there is more and more interest in ours and indeed other technologies for the valorization of fly ashes. And that has really driven a lot of this in international collaboration. And also the, you know, the, the awareness of the waste hierarchy and the, the desire to um, move towards energy recovery means that there are more opportunities out there for us. So policy measures, um, I think there's still a degree of reliance and acceptance of landfill, but governmental and global policies are shifting um, in the right way. And policies for recycled material standards are, are being developed, which is, which is encouraging. We're aware of a number of these, um, that these will take time to, to, to come to fruition. Um, it would be good if we could see some kind of harmonized end of waste concept and regulation, which is not really well developed yet. And I think there needs to be some more robust positive benefits for permanent carbon capture. Um, I think carbon capture and utilization has, has largely been excluded from a number of the emissions trading schemes, but it's good to see that there's quite a lot of noise and a lot of pressure for that to be included. So just a very quick summary then. So OCO is all about the treatment and recycling of thermal residues um, from a wide variety of different industries. We manufacture a carbon negative limestone aggregate. Our key technical challenge has been uh, of, of commercial realization has been um, trying to uh, 
meet the the technical requirements and comply with the the complicated standards and we've had barriers from market adoption and, and competition but there's possibilities coming from changing commercial responsibility and the shift in the waste hierarchy but this needs to be further changes to policy to facilitate waste valorization and uh, thank you all for listening thank you peter uh, for an interesting presentation uh, I also have some uh, questions from the chat for you. And there are a couple of questions regarding chlorines in, in the aggregates. How much are there left in the aggregates and, and do they pose a problem? Um, we have to carefully regulate uh, the soluble salt content, both the chlorides and the sulfates. Um, we achieve that through partially through the, the blending of different waste materials together, but also through the addition of further reagents in the process. So we're also careful about the, the use of our aggregates. We are uh, clear that it, it should not be used in, con in construction products that contain steel. And we provide clear guidance on that. So we ensure that you know, we meet our duty of care in terms of, of the use of the material. And we always ensure that the chemical performance of, of the aggregate meets the intended application. Thanks. Uh, what are the limitations on heavy metals in the concrete formulations? Uh, on, and are the fly ash mixed with other wastes in, in the concrete? Um, in the concrete, we don't actually produce the the concrete itself um, that would be the uh, that would be the role of the, the customers who we supply to but we have a, a leaching specification that was set out when we applied for end of waste so that specification has been uh, approved by the environment agency um, so we've looked at doing geochemical modelling, um, as well as looking at other potential pathways to ensure that the, the, end, the end product is safe. Um, great. Um, that comes back a question that has been posed to the different speakers before, and that's about dioxins. Mm -hmm. Again, that's... that's a. a we have a, a strict limit on the, the dioxin content of the incoming materials. So we regulate that from the front end, but then we also have a, a specification for the outgoing aggregate material. Again, that was agreed as part of the end of waste um, application. So we, we have a, a, you know, an approved limit for that from the, the environment agency. Again, we looked at this from a, uh, an exposure pathway potential. So we looked at um, predominantly an inhalation risk of dust from the aggregate product. Um, so we, we did some risk assessment modeling and that determined that in, in the, uh, the daily risk, the exposure risk was less than you know, an, an, you know, an average person would come into contact with daily. Uh, then I will finish off with uh, two questions regarding the carbon negative footprint. Um, so one is related to um, the relation between the electricity used in the process and um, from what origin is that electricity compared to the carbon dioxide that you are actually taking out. The, the electricity we use is is from the grid. Um, we do we we recycle as much um, we use as much recycled material in the process as possible. Um, you know, for example, the water that's used in the process we we harvest as much as possible um, from from the site. Um, the, the the model is basically a effectively a cradle to grave model based around PAS twenty fifty. So Factored into that is the uh, transport of materials to sites, the, the, the carbon footprint of, of the reagents used, um, the energy that's consumed, as well as the, the CO2 that is permanently captured. Yes, I think we will stay there because we are slightly behind schedule. Um, so thank you very much, Peter, for an interesting presentation and, and uh, interesting answers to the questions. Um, uh, I think I can just, we can go to the wrap up.